Lord, we, we come before you, Father, and we're excited, Lord, that uh, you have this series that you've put in our hearts, Father, in my heart to just talk about making plans, Father, for next year and just kind of getting ahead of it, Father. And so, Lord, I pray that you would, uh, you would open our hearts and that your Holy Spirit would speak to our minds today and that we would be receptive and we wouldn't just hear it, Father, but we would apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you've been a part of, of this series for the last couple of weeks, and by the way, welcome if you are listening online. Uh, so good to, to have you uh, tuning in. Um, if you've been part of this, we started the plan uh, two weeks ago. And the whole idea, let me just tell you about the whole idea of this series, is, is to, uh, uh, to make plans ahead of time uh, about where God has always wanted to take you or where you feel you've always, a goal you've wanted to reach, uh, whether that's spiritual or whether that's physical or whatever it is, and actually make plans to make changes in your life that are going to bring you closer to God, that's going to repair your marriage, that's going to fix relationships, that's going to get you healthier, that's ultimately going to grow the kingdom of God. And, and one of the things, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so excited about this is because I'm, I'm kind of a planner. And in fact, if you ask Evie, um, she, uh, she could sometimes, she's, she wants to be spontaneous sometimes. And I'm like, well, let's plan it out. And she's like, no, let's just go. And I'm like, well, how much is it going to cost? And where are we going to, you know, and, and I'm, I'm just a total probably over planner in a lot of ways in a lot of areas of my life. And her, maybe not so much. But how many like to make plans? How many like, are, you're, you're the planner, and, and, and the person that didn't raise their hand, you're the one that drives them nuts, right? They, you drive <laughs> that other person nuts because uh, you don't do it. But, but here's the deal. Whether we like to make plans or not, we're all, we all have to at some point in our lives because you just can't live an, uh, a, a, an unorganized life. You have to plan when you wake up. You have to plan when you go to work. You have to plan that you're going to eat. There's, there's always planning involved, and I think that we got that from God. God. And God, um, as we said in week one, God's a planning God. He planned uh, this whole thing out. So this place that we live called earth and everything that grows out of it that we eat, he designed that for us, by the way. So for those of you who don't know what greens are and vegetables and fruit, right, that's actually for you, right? And it's really good for you, okay? So eat those, right? Tell our kids that. Eat, eat green stuff. Okay, so um, don't smoke it. Eat it. Okay, well, yeah, never mind. <laughs> We'll just stop right there. Okay, we'll just stop. So um, uh, God planned this whole thing out, right? Let's just move right along from that. We'll edit that out of the video. Uh, we'll, we'll move right, right along with that. But God planned this world. He wanted to give us an opportunity at life, and so he created the world. He created everything in it, and on the sixth day, there comes Adam and Eve, and they had everything already ready for them, right? And so they, we, we believe that they sinned, and sin entered the world, and that caused brokenness between the relationship with man and God. And God said, well, I'm going to plan to fix that, and my plan is to one day send Jesus into the world so that he can die for the sins of the world and, 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 and come back to life, and we can have new life in a repaired, restored relationship as a result of that. And, and, and that's what we believe. And so God made all these plans. And it's no wonder why we like to make plans. It's no wonder why it's kind of in us to plan things out so that things happen. And we said there's about three different types of plans that we like to make in our lives or that actually happen. And some of those are intentional. And sometimes we make plans uh, to go on vacation or to go out to eat or for a birthday, wedding, quinceanera, whatever it is. And when you get to that day, you tell yourself, I'm so glad that we planned for this. So glad I cooked extra food. I'm so glad that, that everything came out the way uh, it, it was planned out to come out, right? And so we're satisfied with those types of plans. There's other plans that we didn't expect that happen. Um, they're the, the people that get sick in your life, maybe you get sick, you lose somebody. Um, we just heard just the prayer request that th those are unplanned events, that happen uh, in your life, uh, death, divorce, sickness, uh, war. Um, we didn't plan on losing our house. I didn't plan on losing my job. I didn't plan on getting a divorce. I didn't plan on, um, you know, whatever it went, happened. Those are the types of plans that sometimes happen to us that we weren't ready for or we didn't, we didn't expect. And then there's a third type of plan, and th this is the plan that you, um, you wish you would have planned, but you just didn't do it or you didn't stick to the plan, right? 
And so we've been u- kind of using this illustration to where if today we were right here, if today was January, right, and we decided that I want to get closer to God in 2016, and we all know that time kind of runs really fast, right? Before you, before you realize it, you, it's like June, and you're like, oh my God, it's already summer. And so all of a sudden, you're over here, and you're like, you know what, I... I I, I kind of plan on getting closer to God, and, and it's already six months later, and I didn't do it, right? And then you find yourself here. I planned on getting healthier, but I didn't do it. I planned on uh, uh, communicating more with my spouse. I planned on spending more time with my kids. I planned on reading my Bible more. I planned on getting back to the gym. I planned on eating better. And then all of a sudden, you, you get to this point, and, and you, what you thought or your intentions didn't lead to your actions, and you kind of have this regret because you didn't plan, and you didn't carry out with you. You didn't carry out the plan or your intentions that you had. And my heart through this series is to talk about the importance of making plans, because they make, dif- they make a difference, and to have a goal in mind. But not only that, to talk about the things that keep you from making plans, the things that kind of, uh, the obstacles that we deal with um, uh, in our journey to, to getting closer to God, to reaching goals, to fixing our marriage, to, uh, uh, to saving some money this year, to uh, improving our relationships, to getting over addictions, to reading the Bible, whatever that is for you. Um, uh, the idea that let's make a plan to do that and let's not get to six months later and regret and be frustrated because we're still in the same place, if not worse, because we never did anything. That's frustrating. And, and we've all done that, right? We've all been there like, man, another year has gone by and it's still the same. Another year has gone by and I didn't save. Another year has gone by and my, my marriage is worse, right? Another year went by and I'm still at this job, right? And, and you didn't make the choices that you wanted to make. And, and so again, I believe that God wants us to have a, a great life. And it's not a perfect life, and we're going to find out that life has its ups and downs. But at the end of the day, God wants us to trust him, and he wants us to take, to take us through things that we need to get through, to, have, to live better uh, while we're here. And one of the things that I think keeps us uh, uh, from, from doing that is just fear. And so we're going to talk about fear today. How many have different fears in your life? You're, you're afraid of things, right? Some of the most common things that people are, are, are afraid of um, is rejection. You don't want to make that choice because you feel like you're going to be rejected. You don't want to ask him or ask her or, or, or apply for the job or whatever it is because you feel like you're, you're going to be rejected. In fact, um, I remember seven years ago, um, I, I started, uh, and, and many of you heard parts of this story, but I started teaching these cycling classes at, at the gym. And I remember driving by um, this big building that they were putting up, and, and all of a sudden, you know, a few weeks later, it said lifetime. You know, it was this huge, what they call mega gyms, right? And I'm like, oh, man, that would be so cool. I bet you all the superstar uh, 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 trainers work there, you know what I mean? And you got to do this and that. And so I, um, I, I said, well, I, I'm interested. I went to their website and just signed up for an email list for any time the job openings were available. And, and so um, I would get emails over the past five or six years anytime there was a job opening. And, and probably about every couple months, there would be an email coming that, that would get to my inbox and it would say, um, cycling instructor, you know, or, or boot camp instructor. I'm like, oh, that's me. But nah, that's not me. Like, I'm, they, they, me, like, you know, like, and I would just delete it because I would be afraid. I would be rejected. I would be afraid. I was afraid that I wasn't good enough. And I just didn't think that much of myself. And, and it just, and because I let that fear just kind of always be there, um, five years went by and I never did anything. And um, a year ago after I got married, we ended up moving down the street from one of these gyms. And I just said, you know what? I'm just going to, it can't hurt, right? You know, I'm 40, like I had a little experience. And, and within about three weeks, I got hired. But the thing is, is I, I was, I could have, maybe potentially got hired a long time ago. But because I was afraid and I just wanted to delete, 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 instead of just saying, God, this is, you know, something that I like to do. Um, 
teaching at the gym is a ministry for me. There's not a week that goes by that somebody doesn't ask for prayer. Or somebody doesn't ask me what I do outside of the gym and I let them know. And, 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 and or there's other believers that we share a lot after class and they're telling me what's going on uh, uh, in their small group or what they're learning about in church. And, uh, and I, I thought of you, Mike, the other day when, when I was having this conversation. And um, it's just a, a ministry for me. And, and so, um, but all that to say is, you know, how long would it have, it took, I, I probably wasted five years of, of being able to do something more effective for God, all because I was afraid. And for some of us, we're afraid of rejection. For some of us, we're afraid to fail. So we don't, we don't make that choice. A lot of us are afraid because we're just not sure if I make this choice, I'm not sure what, where it's going to lead. I'm not sure how I'm still going to provide for my family, or I'm not sure if, 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 if this is really, really it. Uh, for some of us, we need to make decisions, and, and we, we're, we're afraid to be alone. And, and, and if, you're, if you're young and you're dating and you know it's the wrong person to be uh, uh, involved with or you have friends that you know you shouldn't be hanging around with, um, don't be afraid of loneliness. There's a lot of people out there that love you. And there's a lot more people that could be healthier for your life. Some of us, were just afraid of change because it's so comfortable. Like, it's so comfortable to have my routine and I know what to expect, and they know what to expect of me, and so I, I show up for work every day, or, or, I, or, I, or I cook the same food every morning, or whatever it is, and we don't want change. We're afraid of that, and some of us, it's, it's being judged. For some of us, we don't want to be judged, so I'm just going to be quiet. Like, if, if I start saying stuff, if I start really speaking, they're going to judge me, and I just, I don't, I don't want to do that, and some of us are afraid of being hurt, and so we are afraid of being hurt so we don't make the decisions or we're afraid to hurt others so I'm never going to tell her that I do this or I'm never going to tell him that I did that a long time ago. I'm never going to say this because it's going to hurt them and it's just better to not say anything and just hide it, right? And, and for some of us, we feel inadequate. And some of us, I'm convinced that we don't get closer to God because we, we think somehow we're going to lose our freedom to just do what we want to do. And, and because we know getting close to God submits, uh, means submitting my will to God. And what we don't realize and what you don't realize if that's you is that there's nothing more freeing than being completely submissive to God. Say, God, I'm free to love you, and I'm, I'm, this relationship is, is amazing. And it's, it, here, here's an illustration of that. If, you, if you, you would say, I'm kind of that person that doesn't want to lose my freedom, um, would you have said that when you met the person that you love now, right? Because you, before you met that person while you were single, you had freedom. And when you started dating, that freedom started going away, right? But you were okay with that because you were falling in love and you didn't have the same kind of freedom, but there was a new freedom in that relationship. Are, are you following me with that? It's just a transfer of, of how it works. And so um, we have all these fears. And one of the things that Jesus asked his disciples, because again, anytime you read about the life of Jesus and anytime the disciples were around him, he's, he's prepping them to get ready for when he dies, for when he comes back to life, and for when he leaves, because it's going to be in their hands the good news and what he did to spread it all over the world. And so when we read about the events in, in the New Testament, and when Jesus was here, it's him discipling, it's him preparing, it's him telling them, guys, it's me, I'm the son of God, it really is. There's these miracles going on, there's these stories happening, uh, there, there's the, all the preaching that he did, the life that he did together with them. He's getting them ready because it's going to be ultimately their shot at spreading the good news. And I'm glad they did their job because that's why we're here today. And now it's our job to keep moving forward, right? We understand that as a church. It's, that's why we exist as a church, to keep spreading the good news um, of Jesus Christ. But fear uh, keeps us from moving forward. And I know it's kept me from so many things. Um, but let's, let's talk about uh, what happened during this, this story uh, in Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 35. And before we start reading, um, Jesus had been... Uh, teaching all day, and basically he was tired. And one of the things that we believe as Christians is that Jesus was fully God, 
and fully human. And we're about to see both of those sides in this story. Right now we're seeing him human because uh, he's getting tired. Later we're going to see him fully God because he talks to the elements and the wind. So here's how it goes. Uh, Verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. So who's telling his disciples what? Who's, Who's the person leading this? Jesus, okay, he's telling his disciples, let's go over to the other side. He's meaning, let's cross the Sea of Galilee. That's where, he, that's where they're at. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him, they took him along just as, he was in, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And sometimes we miss that part of the story. We always have this picture of our mind, if you've heard this before, that Jesus is in the boat and, and it's just them. But there were actually several boats that were crossing to the other side uh, of, of the Sea of Galilee. So again, Jesus had been preaching all day. Um, he was actually preaching out of the front of the boat. He was just kind of in the shore of the water. Um, all, the, the, all the multitudes were around him. Um, hearing what he had to say, and he was tired, and so they're leaving. They're leaving the crowd. They're like, you know, see you later. Maybe that was the best way to go to escape. Not everybody had boats, so they turned that out. We don't know why, but he had a purpose, right? And we, we know later what the purpose is, but that's the way they chose, and that's what he directed. And so they're going to the other side of uh, the Sea of Galilee, other boats, and not only that, they had people that were experienced. Um, so these guys... They knew how to, how to maneuver a boat. They knew how to fish. They knew how to survive. So they weren't afraid. Um, so they all got in their boat, and they followed Jesus' instructions to go to the other side. Okay, so keep that perspective in mind. They're following what Jesus is saying. Verse 37 says, A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And these, in the NIV version, we don't really use a lot of these words, but basically there was a big storm that came in the Sea of Galilee, and the boat almost went under is basically what, it, what it's saying. And so um, if you do any kind of research about the Sea of Galilee, it was about 650, 680 feet below sea level. There, it was surrounded by mountains, almost like in, in a valley-esque type of uh, environment. And so um, it was very common for a storm to just kind of happen out of nowhere. Um, It's kind of like uh, living in Colorado, right? We we go to work shoveling ice off of our our windshield and we leave, you know, taking off our coats and and the sun is like beating us down. Like it just, it it went from calm to storm in the the middle of, uh, it it could happen anytime. And so they were kind of used to that. They knew that, um, but they didn't expect it at this time. You know, they, they, they heard Jesus, they followed him, let's go across, but this big storm came up, and it was one of those storms, and kind of like the plans that we talked about at the beginning that they didn't plan on. And all of a sudden, if you could imagine just being in a boat, um, feeling like at any moment this thing could turn, and we're all gone. And, and keep, keep in mind, they didn't have anything like we have today. When we think of boats today, we think of big vessels, machines. We think of motors and, 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 and all this. And no, there's, they didn't have any. These were wood. Very basic. And, and, and so they're freaking out, right? And here's the thing. Jesus is with them, though. And I just want you to think about that for a moment. The storm happens. They think they could possibly die at any moment, but Jesus is with them. And I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever dealt with something in your life so strong, some kind of, uh, of, of storm that shakes you, in a way that you've never been shaken before, a death, a divorce, a, 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 a a loss of a job, home, whatever, an accident. And, and, and in that moment, sometimes we forget and sometimes we, we need to be reminded that, that Jesus is with us. In fact, in your notes, I just put, you're in the storm, but you're, you're with his presence. Um, one of the things that we believe as Christians is that when we accept Christ into our heart, into our lives. We believe that he sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit lives within us. And the Holy Spirit dwells within us. 
And one of the things that we need to remember that when these storms come, Jesus hasn't left. He's right there. In fact, this is what Jesus was doing. In verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, the stern, I'm going to show you a picture of kind of a diagram of, of, a, uh, of a boat here. And the stern was actually the back part of the boat. So you have the, the bow, the starboard, the port, and the stern. So Jesus was in the back part of the boat, right? And, and uh, I don't know how to picture this, but there's a big storm and he's still asleep, right? How many have kids that they don't wake up for nothing, right? Like, like uh, one, one time um, I was having trouble waking Jose up for school after a long summer and I thought, you know, I'm going to do something kind of funny. So I went on YouTube and found the, the most annoying sounds I possibly could and turned it up as loud as I could. And it was like, it was like uh, uh, chickens and turkeys and horns and, 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 uh, and, and, and trains. It was just this crazy bunch of noises at the same time. And, and I'm, under, I'm, I'm playing it laughing my head off because I'm like, he's going to wake up and be so mad at me. And he didn't wake up. I'm like, Really? Like, you're sleeping through all this, right? Um, and it re- I, I, I found this little cartoon, and I thought it was, it was kind of funny. And like, but uh, here's Jesus. They're, they're freaking out. And the caption says, just, just give me five more minutes. Just give me five more minutes. He was, he was asleep. Okay. All right. I, I thought I would get a bigger laugh than that. But um, sometimes <laughs> Jesus was asleep, right? So he wakes up, and, and they're freaking out. And they say, don't you care? And, and I, I, the Bible is so, like, like, transparent. Like, don't you even care? You know, have you ever said that in an argument? You don't even care about me, right? Don't you even care? And, you know, and, and, and Jesus is there. Jesus is right there with them. And they're going through this thing, and, and, and Jesus wakes up. And, you know, let me, let me just say this, like, the Bible, um, it never promised that we're not going to go, go through anything. The Bible n- never says that just because you've accepted Christ, your life is going to be perfect. Um, it never says that anywhere. In fact, what it does say is that we can have hope because like in John 16, it says, I've told you these things so that you may, be, that you may have peace. In this world, here's what the Bible does say, you will have what? trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we are told that we're going to go through things, um, and they're going through stuff, but Jesus has overcome. Jesus is with them. He's with them in this moment. He hasn't left them. And I can't think of, of, I, I don't know even how to explain it, but we sometimes, we our faith gets a little shaken and, and, and it might be a little more understandable because it's by faith and we haven't seen Jesus physically. We haven't seen God because he, he's all powerful and, and he's invisible. And like, we don't see that. So we kind of have those types of doubts. But Jesus was actually in the boat with them. I mean, think about this. He, he's, he's like right there, right? He's right there. He's the son of God. And, and they're, they're still... They're, they're freaking out, you know. Um, there, there was an article that came out a while back uh, that said um, people who are older who live alone, um, they live longer when there's something alive in the house. So that could be um, that could be a plant, that could be an animal, that could be um, a, a grandkid that somebody forgot, right? A great grand, um, but they 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 live longer. Because there's some kind of life in their house, right? And when I, when I heard about that article, I'm like, you know what? Like, isn't, that's kind of like us. Like, we, we should come alive and we should have this will to keep going forward through whatever it is because Jesus lives within us. He lives in our heart. He lives in our life. Um, and so your next note says, don't, don't let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt what? The presence of God. 
Just because you're going through a storm doesn't mean Jesus is not on the boat. Just because you're going through whatever you're going through doesn't mean he's not there. He's there. He's with you. And we act like sometimes when things go, happen in our lives that we're abandoned and we're all alone and nobody's there and, and whatever it is, but Jesus is with you. He's with you. And, and even, even more than that, the, the next note says you're, you're in the storm for his purpose. Here, here's what that means. Jesus He's the one that said, let's go to the other side. It was, it was his idea, right? And if Jesus is fully God and if he's fully man, that's what we believe about the nature of Jesus, he must have known the storm was coming. And would you say that even though wherever you're at with God, would you say storms will come in your life? Would you say that? We know this, right? We know a storm is coming, but what we forget sometimes is that Jesus is with us, right? And, and, the, and, and, and you, there's a purpose behind it. Now, we, we don't know for sure if Jesus caused the storm, if it was just nature because it happened all the time. There's some uh, scholars that believe it was a demonic attack because of the way he rebukes it later. We don't know that, but we do know that he knew something was going to happen. And it was for his purpose, for his reasoning. And your next note says, uh, uh, they didn't experience a storm because they were out of God's will. They experienced a storm because they were in God's will. Now, sometimes we experience storms because we're out of God's will, right? And because we make dumb choices and we do things we know we shouldn't. And yeah, of course, that's going to produce um, some storms in your life. But oftentimes when we listen to Jesus and God is calling us to do something and, and a storm comes, you're still in his will. You know, I've heard so many people tell me, um, even friends that I would consider really close to God, they're like, I, I did what God says. I must not even be called by him. I'm like, are, are, you, are you kidding me? You, you, were, you were preaching the word. You were out um, living a life for Christ. You were leading your family the way God wanted you to do. You were, you, were, you were working, providing. You were doing all these things that God wants us to do. And, and because you ran into this storm, you all of a sudden think that God never called you. He called you. And part of the storm experience means that you're in his will. That's a different way to think about it. That's a different way to think about it. Here, here's what James said. In James 1, 2, and 3, you've heard this before if you've been around church. Consider it pure what? Joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. It means that the next time you go through it, you're going to persevere even, more, even better. And so there's something to trials. There's something to storms that God uses for his purpose. And ultimately, his purpose is to strengthen you, to grow your faith to grow you so that you can do even bigger and better things for God. But what would happen if you just gave up? Again, we're talking about this whole idea of this plan. Like, we want to do this. God, next year, I don't want to end 2016 thinking, why didn't I start that? Why didn't I get back involved? Why didn't I, why didn't I start doing this? I don't, I don't want to be there, right? And, and God's saying, you don't have to be. And I might even use some storms next year to get you where I want you to be. And you'll still be in my will. Don't forget that storms, are, it, it, it's, it, it, it's like a test. And I don't know any good teacher or professor that wouldn't test you to see if they can get you to pass, right? 
if you're in a course and you're learning, at some point you have to prove that you know what you've learned. And storms are one way of that happening. Can I get through this storm believing and trusting that Jesus is with me and growing as a result of it? Or, or do I just say I'm not a test taker and give up? Because I freak out when I take tests. I freak out when, I have to, when, I, when I'm forced to think about what I should already know. And I know I know it, but it's just, it all goes blank, right? When I get to the test. That fear, that fear, that fear, that fear that keeps us from, from moving forward. But if you would trust Jesus and you get over the fear and you pass the test, you'll never regret it. You're never going to regret it. In fact, uh, verse 4 of, of James chapter 1 says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be what? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. So the Bible tells us that it's going to make us mature and complete. And I, I don't know, I think we all know somebody in our lives that we would consider super spiritually mature. They're like spiritual giants. How many know somebody like that? And if you were to ask them, if you were to sit down with them in a conversation or an interview and just say, you know, I would consider you um, just a really spiritual, uh, spiritually mature person. How did you get to that point? They would tell you a lot of things, but one of the things they would say is that I've been through a lot and I've trusted Jesus through everything. And because I've trusted Jesus and because he's been faithful and because I got through it, I trust him even more, right? And because the second time it happened and because this other thing that happened and whatever happened, I kept trusting, 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 and I'm still alive today. I'm even more trusting. And not only do I trust him more, but I'm more mature as a result of it. And I've gotten to places that I never thought I would get to because of that trial. Oftentimes, when you do something great, or if you know anybody who's done something great in their life, you could trace it back to something big and, and difficult that they found that, that, helped, that, that happened to them in their life. Something that was life-changing. And they got through it. Here's what, here, here's what Jesus did. They woke him up. Verse 39 said, He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet. And, and we could even say that a little louder. Quiet, right? Like there's, there's an emphasis there. Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. This is the God side of Jesus. And again, if you're new to Christianity, if you're new to to uh, the biblical theology, or we believe that Jesus was fully human and fully man at the same time. The man side of him was tired. The human side was tired. The God side of him got up and said, when quiet, enough of you. I'm the creator. I created you. I have power over you. And he demonstrated that. And here's what happens, verse 40. He said to his disciples, and here's the question that Jesus, and here's the big question of the day. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? It feels like the boat's going over. It feels like things, they're gonna die. Jesus is there, they wake him up. He fixes the situation. He intervenes and, and he looks at him. And can you imagine? I mean, just, just picture yourself in the boat and, and Jesus standing there, wherever, whatever part of the boat he was standing, and, and looking at these terrified disciples and fishermen and, and just asking, can you just imagine yourself if Jesus was standing in front of you and he asked you, Why are you so afraid? Jesus himself is asking you, why are you so afraid? And then he follows it up by saying, do you still have no faith? And that's huge because for some of us who have been paralyzed by fear, that means that fear has paralyzed our faith. 
And so whatever area in your life where you've been paralyzed by fear, that means that area of faith in your life is also paralyzed. I, d- I don't believe. I'm afraid, and it affects my faith. I mean, they, they go hand in hand. That's exactly what Jesus is implying here. Why are you so afraid? If you weren't afraid, you would have faith. But he's saying, why are you so afraid? Do you still have, don't, do you, still have no faith. And in, in, in the context of, of, of the disciples, he was saying, um, you know, I kind of did a lot of miracles already, and I've really spent a lot of time with you guys. We kind of live together, right? Well, you really know me. You know what I've done. There's probably a reason why all these multitudes are following us and we have to go the other way. Why are you still afraid? Why are you so afraid? And do you, do you still have no faith? And Jesus, again, he would say the same thing to you. What are you afraid of? Why are you still afraid of it? And is, do you, do you just don't have faith then in that area? You don't have faith that your, your, your job situation could change? You don't have faith that you can get closer to me? You don't have faith that you can, you can um, um, pass the test or you could go back to school or you can get out of a bad relationship? Not if you're married. We've, we've fixed that one, all right? Um, and and, and that, you, that you can't, you know, whatever it is, do you not have faith? And I can't say that enough. Your, your faith, the fear is tied to your faith. Whatever area, think about it. Whatever area you've been deathly afraid of in your life to change, move, add, try, whatever it is, it's directly directly tied to your faith. I'm not going to do it. I don't have faith. Really what you're saying is I don't have faith that God can help me get there. I don't really have faith that God could give me the better job. I don't really have faith that I'll be able to still supply for my family. I don't really have faith that it's ever going to get better. I don't really have faith that I'm ever going to be healed. I don't really have faith that I could ever learn that. I don't really have faith that I could ever get to this place in my life. It's, that's what you're really saying. And in verse 41, they said they were terrified. The Bible says they were terrified and asked each other, who, who is this? Can you imagine like he, he already told them so many times who he is, and they're looking at each other. Who is this? Even, even the wind and the waves obey him. And I don't think that was a question that was saying, who is this? I, was, I think that was more of a, who is this? That like, It was an acknowledgement that he was who he said he was. It wasn't a question of, who do we got here on the boat with us? It's, who is this? That I mean, God, who are you that you love me still? Right? That's kind of like that kind of... Who is this? Who are you? Who are you, God, that you would still accept me? Who are you, God, that despite my faith and despite everything that I have lacked in my life, you still love me? Have you ever prayed those prayers? God, who are you that you would do that? That's the kind of question they're asking here. And they go from calling him teacher earlier in the story to acknowledging him as Lord, and that's huge. That's huge. Again, that, that last point, that's what that last point is. The storm caused them to see Jesus not just as a teacher, but as what? As Lord. Jesus wasn't just a teacher. He was the son of God. He was God in the flesh. And they, they're realizing this at this point. But I'm telling you, if you let fear run your life, you let your faith be paralyzed. Your, your faith just stays paralyzed in whatever area that is. You might have big faith in certain areas of your life, but there's that area where you're afraid and that your, your faith is just paralyzed. It, it can't go anywhere because of the fear. I don't want us, you, me, our church, I don't want us to, to look back In, in a few months from now or a few years from now and say, why don't we ever do that? How come we didn't take that risk and just have faith that God can do something with a little? Why didn't we ever just try that thing? Or why didn't we ever just, you know, and whatever it is for you, I don't know. But I, want, I don't want you to live a life of regret. One of the things that, um, just to finish here, that I've always regretted in my life is, uh, is being afraid to make tough decisions as a leader. 
You know, Bethel would probably tell you this too. Um, some of those things in my, the life of, of, of my uh, time as a pastor and as a leader, um, the, there, there's times where I know that there's certain decisions that need to be made or that just isn't the right thing or I don't, I'm kind of frustrated with the way that's going, but I, I'm so afraid to hurt the person or that the families will leave or that whatever, you know, that I don't, I just kind of let it keep going. And because I let it keep going or because I, 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 I assume that the other, that, that what they think they want or what they want or whatever, like, because you got to understand, and, and uh, I get so many, so much input as, as a pastor, and I know our church isn't like ginormous or anything, but I, I get a lot of input. Hey, the people want to do this, or we should still do this, or we can't stop doing this, and all this we need to do, we need to do, we should do, we should do, and, and, and I've found myself over the years more saying, well, okay, instead of, and, and in my heart saying, that's not the right thing, though, like, that's, that shouldn't be where we were going, but since they want to, and they have a good heart, and they're willing, let's just go with it, I'm like, and, and then I, I, I go home frustrated, or I hang up the phone thinking, why, why can't I just tell them it's not the right thing? Why can't I just tell them that's a good idea, but it's not the best idea? Or, or it's a good thing we can do, but it's not the most effective way to do it. Why can't I just do that? And that's something that I've struggled with as, as a pastor. And, and so in, in the coming year, like next year, and as we finish out this series, I, I have some things in my heart that I want to share that are new, that are different. And, and, and I don't want to be afraid to share them with you. And it might shake us up a little bit, and it might turn us upside down, because let's, let's, let's face it, you know, our church, and, 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 and I've, I've, you know, just kind of been talking to the Lord over the past few months. Um, I think we've gotten to a place where, where there's a lot, we're really comfortable. Um, we, we, uh, we're kind of like in a long-term relationship that has no romance anymore. Have you ever felt like that, Right? And the, the passion is kind of gone, right? And we just kind of show up and just say, oh, it's Joe again, right? We don't ever say that out loud, right? Because you know what's up if you say that. No, but, and you, you no, know, hear me out though. That, that we just don't have anything to be passionate about right now. And I feel that, and if you've, if you've been kind of connected to God or with, What's going on? I think you might feel some of that too. But that's going to change. That has to change. And my, what I'm asking for you guys is to pray for me. I'm, I'm always praying for you, but pray for me that I would have the courage to make some of the tough decisions and some of the big changes that I know, that I know that I've always wanted to do that we just haven't done because of my fear. Would you, help, would you pray for my faith? Because I, I've always believed that God has big things. And I'm not saying any, what we've done in the last decade has not, been, had, has not made an impact in the life of our church. But I know that God wants to take us to another level, and that might mean a test. And that might mean a storm's coming to shake us up a little bit so we can wake up and get moving again. I don't know what that means, but I know that God is, is birthing something new in, in my heart, and, and we, we, we're going to do this. Um, so would you pray for me, too? I don't want for any of us to, to live in regret, and I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I couldn't live with myself if for the next five years we just kept doing the same thing. And we really got nowhere. And I've always told you that. I, I, I've always told you that I would rather go get a, a, a job at a convenience store or something where I could interact with other people all day and, and, and share the gospel in a different way than doing the same, what are we doing here, right? You, you hear me? We, we have to do and we have to move forward and we have to allow God to shake us up and we can't be afraid. And so what I'm asking you is you can't be afraid. What, I'm, what God is saying, don't be afraid anymore. 
make the changes you've got to make and be ready for the church to make the changes that the church has to make in order for us all to get better. Are you with me on this? Yes? God is good. And he loves us. He loves us so much. Let's pray.